Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, when I was 11 or 12, both 11 and 12, my father got uh, jobs in as a, a ore analysis guy. He's a geologist. He's a professor here at the university, and he'd get summer jobs in other places. So I, I had the ideal childhood. Lived in New Hampshire two summers. I lived in Idaho two two summers. New York two summers, and Michigan two summers. So. I have no complaints about my childhood. I wasn't one of those people that had complaints about the way they were treated growing up. I just had an idyllic childhood and loved it. One of the trips that we had, uh, we got to go on was the Idaho trip. And, and what he would do, we lived in Caldwell, Idaho, which is about 20 miles from Boise. And dad would travel to the Waihee Mountain Range and get silver samples or samples looking for silver. His work eventually led to that area and that mine becoming the second leading uh, silver producing mine in the United States for about two decades. Um, I just had to throw that in there for dad. <laughs> but I, as a kid, as an 11 and 12 year old, was not interested in silver mines. I was interested in those rainbow trout that were up in the mountains hiding behind boulders in the streams and that's what I went with dad for. Sometimes he had me work with ore samples and, and I, my brother worked for him all summer long and, and I was seven years younger than my brother and I just made the excuse, I can't do that kind of work. I want to fish. And so I got to fish most of the time and, and I always looked forward to getting up and I didn't go every day, but I, I went quite often. And, and Dad had a Bronco that we rented during that period of time. And uh, if you remember the Bronco, there's not a whole lot of circulation. And back in the 70s, they didn't even have air conditioning. Um, and if you've been in the southern part of Idaho, it gets very, very hot. Um, but I thought about those fish up in the mountains. And so I was like, I, I'll do anything to get up to those fish and fly fish with them. I learned how to tie my own flies and the Royal Coachman, if you guys are fly fishermen, that was one of the things that I loved to do, uh, throwing my own flies at these trout and catching them, and it was so much fun. But getting there was a whole other story. Driving 70 miles in the Wahi Desert, because it's, it's not a, uh, northern Idaho is lush, they get a lot more rain than southern Idaho, it's a desert, it's hilly, it's mountains. This whole area, is there's a Snake River that runs through it. If you've lived in Idaho or visited or gone through, you kind of know where I'm talking about. And this canyon that the, that the Snake River cut is called Hell's Canyon, and there's a reason for that. It's 2,000 feet deeper than the Grand Canyon. So this is huge relief. Um, when you drive into this area, the paved road stops and it becomes dirt road and you're going in these switchbacks and I can remember as a kid because my brother was in the front seat dad was driving and I was in the back seat I can remember being in the back seat every time we hit one of those switchbacks I don't like heights and it's like that and I would go to the other side <laughs> and then we would hit another switchback I'm over here and I just pray God I know I'm not a very good boy but please <laughs> help dad drive safely and all those kinds of prayers one of the things that happened when we hit that that started to go up, the pavement disappeared, it turned into dirt road, and the front wheels would kick all the dirt going up, and it would go past the passenger in the front, and it would go straight to the back. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a dirt, in a dust storm, but that's what this was like. And if you've ever been in a, a room where there's exhaust and you're trying to get out of there, you're trying to do something and doors are closed and you take a big breath and you, you try to get your oxygen and then you come back and well there's nowhere to escape this dust it was so thick and I can remember how terrible that was it was a little bit of flying dust can make a guy miserable and a lot of flying dust can really do some damage I think probably I can remember the dust being so thick and and as I was you can't you, you try to do everything to escape it you try to hold your breath but you can't hold your breath for an hour because it, it takes an hour to get up in that place where, they, where he was working and I can remember okay tomorrow I'm gonna put this in this handkerchief in some water and then I'll tie it around but <laughs> you know it's trying everything I tried to go in the floor well anything to escape all that dust 
Inevitably, you can't escape it. It clings to you. You breathe it. And they would laugh at me because every time we'd get to the destination where we were working that day, uh, I would kick the door open and kick and sputter and sput and spit and, and try to get all this stuff out of my lungs. And they would just laugh because they were in the front seat. And it's amazing what you will do just for a breath of fresh air, right? Um, I'd like to start this morning by a passage that the psalmist uses in Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is not written by David. It's written by another psalmist. And he says these words. He says, my soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. Sometimes in our difficult times or if you've walked away from God, if you've if you've walked away from prayer, you've walked away from the word of God, you're walking away from life. Because only in God is there really eternal life and only in prayer can you connect with him and only through his word can you connect with him. And that is the source of life. And so when we leave off these things, when we leave off our relationship with God and we don't nurture it, when we, when we ignore the reality that comes to us through prayer, we ignore the reality of life and we just subside. It's almost as if we're in a dust storm. And the psalmist uses this analogy of dust, just like the Idaho dust. He says, this dust clings to me. I remember getting out of the Bronco and every part of my exposed body, my arms and, and my face was just caked with dust and I would wipe it all off. And that's what it's like when you're in a difficult situation. The dust will cling to you. The negative thoughts will cling to you and you've got to wipe them off somehow. And that's what the power of prayer does. When you pray, it's a cleansing that takes place on the inside. It's a cleansing that takes place in your mind and you begin to think new thoughts because in prayer, heaven begins to intervene and heaven begins to interact with you, begins to interact with your mind and the way that you think and your whole patterns of thinking can change through prayer. And that's why taking a few days of concentrated prayer right now in the next couple of weeks is so important for us. Consecrated times. You see it over and over in Scripture where Paul took time to pray. Daniel in the Old Testament set himself to pray. These people knew the importance of prayer and didn't just let it happen by accident. They took it as a responsibility that this is a day I will pray. And that's what we have to do. Don't just let life slip on by. Press in, in prayer, to receive the light that comes to us from God. You don't want to live this life alone. You want to live it with God. And the way that we live it with God is by interacting with Him in conversation. And I thought it was so apropos that as Connie Cromwell was sharing with us Wednesday night about prayer, that God is the God in the room that has wisdom. And if you take time, not always just to express your own self to him, which is fine, but take time to listen to him because he's got something to say to each one of us. So we come with that kind of faith. What do you have to say to me today, God? My father, that's the beginning of Good, healthy prayer. And it brings us life. My soul clings to the dust. It would give me life according to your word. The psalmist here is using this word dust as an example of what happens to us in our minds during difficult times or, or when we walk away from the life that God gives. But dust here is not just a simple word or a general way of saying that he is struggling. Dust He's trying to use this word to express his utter failure, his recognition of his complete brokenness. It's not just dust that clings to him on the outside, but he says, my soul is dust. My soul, my, I'm completely broken. I have got no chance without God. 
This is what he's trying to express. And we see this term dust in other passages of the Old Testament. We see God saying after the fall of Adam and Eve and after they had come into this brokenness that they had never experienced before. He says, till you return to the ground, for out of you, you are taken, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. And we see this word dust attributed to the curse. That God had to let this curse be on mankind so that he could redeem it. Because righteousness cannot inhabit unrighteousness. Darkness cannot inhabit light. And God is light. So he had to give us over to this curse in order to send his son to redeem us. But the fall is not the final word. And we can find hope and peace in God again, even in a fallen world. So this passage begins, Psalm 119, the early parts of the passage. Actually, this is the longest psalm in the Bible. It's an incredible psalm. But it starts with the psalmist clinging to dust, and it ends with the psalmist clinging to the Word. And in verse 31 and verse 32 of Psalm 119, he says, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in a way, in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Now, we, if you're familiar with medical science, you probably understand that an enlarged heart is not a good thing. <laughs> but in spiritual terms, it is a good thing. When you spend time with God and God interacts with you in conversation and He speaks to you, His words bring life that enlarge your heart. Meaning what? In, in simplest terms, it means that you have a, a larger heart to run with. You're not weighed down by sin. You're not weighed down by your incapacities. Your heart is enlarged by faith because you know that you can do something that He's called you to do that seems impossible. Isn't that exciting? You can have an enlarged heart. And this is what the psalmist is saying. It was clinging to dust and it was weighing me down. My soul was dust. And now my soul clings to His Word. My soul clings to truth. And that truth and His Word enlarged my heart. Because I spent time with God, I'm stronger now. I'm ready to run like I've never run before. So when it seems that I cannot escape the dust in the Bronco, there is a way of escape. And it's through His life-giving Word. It's through time with Him. So I hope you wake up tomorrow morning thinking, you know, I just want to go to the source of life. I want to go to my Father. I want to go to my Creator. And I want to, con I want to have a conversation with Him. I want to talk to him. How do I talk to him, Dave? I really don't know how to do this. Just talk to him like you would talk to me. Just talk to him like you would talk to a family member or a friend. And I'll add something to that. Talk to him like you would talk to a close friend. Share your heart. And he'll listen. And then take time to listen because he's got some things to tell you. And listen to me. If you'll do this, just... Commit to this. When he starts to tell you and talk to you and commune with you and he has direction for you and he, it'll come to you in impressions. When he gives those impressions to you, do them. There's so many things I've missed in my life because I haven't immediately put in practice the things I got in prayer. And I thought it was just my own head. And then I recognized, you know, if I would have done, oh, that was God. <laughs> you ever been there? God's for you. God's there to help you. So it'll be good when you talk to him. C.S. Lewis was one of the authors of, of, of children's books, and he's, you may have heard of him. He wrote uh, the Narnia series, and he wrote another book called Mere Christianity, which I highly recommend, if, especially if you're, you're, you're not sure about the Christian faith and you're just exploring it. Maybe you're here today because of that. And you're just stepping in because you, you, you're just hungry to know a little bit more. I really recommend 
Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. But in his own story, there was a movie called Shadowlands that was made about his story. And it gives the story about him and his wife when they, they married. And then she was, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer shortly after that. And at one point, he was so down and so distraught because his new wife uh, was going to die. And her name was Joy. And then Joy did pass away. And a friend of his came to him, a friend named Harry, and he called C.S. Lewis Jack. That was what he was affectionately called by his friends and family. And his friend Harry came to him and he said this. He said, Christopher can scoff, Jack, but I know how hard you've been praying and now God is answering your prayers. He was talking, trying to encourage him after his wife had passed. And Lewis replied, he said, that's not why I pray, Harry. I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time. Waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. Guys, there is so much that is happening in our lives that brings bitterness that brings disappointment, that brings anger. And as soon as we realize this, the better. We have to realize how helpless we are against those things. And prayer is really the only thing that helps. When something so terrible has happened in your life and you're enduring so, such a loss in your life, what do you do with that? What do you do with the bitterness? What do you do with the anger? There's only one thing that you can really do, and that's give it to God. And then God will give you back peace in return. He really is big enough to handle it if we'll take it to Him. So instead of just listening to me right now, let's just do that. Because I'm convinced that there's some of us here that are dealing with this bitterness, that are dealing with anger, that are dealing with hurt. Can we just close our eyes for a minute and follow me in prayer right now? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we just come to you because we're helpless against these powerful forces of our emotions. And we give these things to you. We absolutely give them to you and we're not going to take them back. We cast them over on you and thank you, God, that you take our anger, you take our bitterness, you take our hurt, you take our confusion, you take all these emotions, you take all these thoughts, and you give us peace back in return. And I pray, God, that you would begin to fill that vacancy on the inside because we thought if we didn't worry, what were we going to do? Well, now we give you our worries, our anxieties, and our cares now in that vacuum, God, fill our hearts with your peace. Fill us with your spirit. Enlarge our hearts now so that we can run with you again. John understood the importance of praying, life-giving prayers, and that's really what the title of this Simple message is, is to pray life. Sometimes we pray worry, right? Sometimes we pray our cares. Sometimes we pray anger prayers. Lightning bolt on that person, please God. In a different tone. But how do we pray life? John gives us some great instructions on how to pray life. How many of us want to learn how to pray life? Because it'll make a big difference in our prayers and in our life and in those people that we're praying for. But in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16, he has these words, he writes these words. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them what? Life. A little bit louder. Life. He'll give them life. So how do I pray these prayers that give life for me and for, for you? For the people that we're praying for, people today tend to react in three different ways towards sin. 
They either deny it, and you can write that down in your handout. They deny it, or they welcome it, or they overcome it. John wrote a, this little letter we call 1 John to explain to followers of Christ about the poison of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is, is a big word that simply means that Jesus didn't ever come in the physical flesh. He wasn't a real person. Jesus was just an idea. And so John wrote to the followers of Christ and he told them that is so wrong. He says, absolutely not. We touched him. We heard him. We saw him. We experienced him. He was here in every bit of physicality. And he was the son of God. So John writes this to the believers there. And he's not writing to, to Gnostics. He's writing to the followers of Christ. Refuting Gnosticism. Saying this is a false teaching. So a lot of times people get it mixed up. Who John is writing to. And notice that John makes it very clear who he's writing to. And just very quickly look at this. In the next slide, if you would put that up, please. Notice who John is writing to. He, call, he has names for the people that he's writing to. His audience is called, dear, he calls them dear children. He calls them dear friends. He calls them brothers and sisters. These are not unbelievers. These are believers. Next slide, please. He calls them that, he says that they had an anointing from the Holy One. Those aren't unbelievers. These are believers. They were called children of God. They had received the Holy Spirit. So these are all believers that he's writing to. So when we're talking about John writing to believers, we can say that he's writing to us too, right? Okay, next slide, please. He says that they are from God, that they had received eternal life. Unbelievers, I hope that you'll receive eternal life today, and I hope that you'll consider it. But you haven't yet until you commit yourself to Jesus Christ and ask him to come in and change you. Okay, and at that point, it's a free gift and he'll dump eternal life into you and provide a place in heaven for you when you die. That's for you. But until that time, you haven't received eternal life. It's out there. It's ready to come in you, but you haven't got it on the inside of you yet. But he said to these people that he's writing to, you have received eternal life and you had believed and that they had been enlightened by the son of God. So, you know. Evidence is very clear that these are believers that he's writing to and that we are that and that they were in him who is true. So they are already in Christ. That's who he's writing to. So if he's writing to believers there, he's also writing to us. Now, notice another thing that John is explaining to these followers of Christ. That. He begins to explain, I'm going to read a scripture to you here in just a second, but he begins to explain what to do with the sin, the mistakes, the difficulties that you cause yourself after you have come into Christ. Extremely important to handle this correctly. Not talking to a person on how to get into Christ. They're already into Christ, but how do you maintain a relationship with Jesus Christ? And that and a relationship with the Father. And this is what Paul is talking about. Listen to me very, very carefully. This is what John excels in. He excels in telling us about a relationship with God and how to maintain a relationship with God. Why is this so important? Because your relationship with God, now this sounds so simple, but grab it. Your relationship with God is just that. It's a relationship. Okay, we can go home now. <laughs> but when we, when we complicate things and make it more than a relationship and make it a bunch of do's and don'ts and, and regulations, that's when it gets sour. That's when your relationship just doesn't go anywhere. But how, if this is a relationship with my father, then how do I maintain that? 
Think about your family relationship. If I never said to my wife, who I've offended more than any person in this world, I don't try to, but just because we live together, because we rub shoulders together, we can push each other's buttons sometimes. I know none of you have ever been there. We don't try to do that. It's just human nature. If I never told her these simple words, I'm sorry, what would my relationship with her be like? I have four children, one son, three daughters. If I never told them I'm sorry when I made a mistake, especially when they were younger, oh, daddy just messed up, I'm sorry. And I still have to. If, if I never did that, what would my relationship with them be like? Somebody. It would be terrible. It would be horrible. And they would be bitter. Fortunately, they all like coming home. It takes more food to feed them. <laughs> or forget sometimes when they're all home how much it took to feed these guys. Now they're growing and it takes a lot more. But this is what our relationship with is it is with our Father in heaven. It's a relationship. And it's maintained by confession. My confession to her is I'm sorry. So when I make a mistake, when I don't do what God asked me to do, when I do what I'm told not to do in His Word, I've made a mistake. I've sinned. I've made it wrong in my relationship. Things are just not right. You know when things just aren't right with somebody, don't you? In a, in a close relationship. That's the way it is with God. You know that it's just not right. You just know. And God knows, obviously. He knows. What do I do with that? John tells us what to do. Just say, I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that you're going through and it's impossible. You know how I know that this is not talking to um, unbelievers. I know that this is that John's addressing believers because he said, confess your sins before God. And he's faithful and just to forgive those sins, cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I know that's not talking about unbelievers because I remember when I came to Christ, there ain't no way I could tell you all the sins that I committed. And I was a young man, I was 17, but I had plenty I could have confessed. I could not remember all those. And God doesn't expect an unbeliever to do that either. And if you're exploring your faith, God doesn't want you to sit down on the ground or kneel down on the ground and confess all your sins. Just recognize that the condition of your heart is sin. And that you need a change, a new birth. And it's a supernatural act when you ask God to come in and Jesus to come in and, and change you or save you or whatever the words are that you want to use. God sees that. He recognizes that and honors that. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He gives you the right he becomes, to become a, a child of God. And He changes you on the inside to where you're a child of God and not a child of Satan anymore. And that's what we were, John says. We were children of the, of the evil one. And now we're children of light. We're children of God. It's so much better being a child of God. It's so much better being a new creation in Christ. And I want to treat that so respectfully. And I want to keep a tender heart towards God. And how do I do that? Confess it. When, when I know that I do wrong, then I just want to confess that. It doesn't mean I have to. Uh, sometimes I feel like Peter, you know, when, he, when Jesus said, I need to wash your feet. And he said, no, not me, not me. He says, no, you have no part of me then. And he said, oh, give me a bath. <laughs> he really did. He said, I, he said, and Jesus said, no, I don't need to do all that. I just want to make it right. I need to make it right. So in prayer, this, this word confess, I'm not trying to get too technical on you, but the word confess in the original language in Greek, it means to continually do that. This is an ongoing thing. It will never stop. It will never stop. As long as we live in this fallen world, as long as you live in your fallen flesh, which is all of us, 
then we'll continually have this discipline of confessing before God. Again, you're not going to, God doesn't expect you to, neither does anybody else expect you to try to list all your sins. That would be, you know what that would do? That would create such a sin consciousness in, in you that it would get nowhere. And pretty soon, you know what a sin consciousness is? When you're always conscious of your sin, you know what that does? It shrinks your heart. It doesn't empower you. When you're always thinking about the things that you've done wrong, it shrinks you. This is a way out. This is a way out that God has given us so that your heart can be enlarged again, that you can run with strength and power. And the only way that that can happen is if you get that stuff out before God. And once you begin to do that and give it to God, then he can fill your heart with strength. So how do I do that? It's a simple word. Humility. I humble myself before God. And I do that continually. Every day. I start it that way. Our Father who art in heaven. In other words, this day is not about me. It's about you. Our Father who art. It's not about my name. It's about your name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom, not my kingdom, your kingdom be done in my life today. Your kingdom be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you feeling this? This is the power of prayer. And this is what John's trying to get across to us, that we can continually have this interaction with God. And it's life giving. It's not life taking. It's heart enlarging. It's not heart shrinkage. Oh, I want my heart to be bigger. So John says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and he'll forgive us all our sins. He purify us, 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 us from all unrighteousness. And then I want to remind you what the psalmist reminded us of in Psalm 130. And these words are beautiful. If you, Lord, kept a record of our sins, Lord, who could stand? Aren't you glad that he has forgiven you? Hmm. So we don't deny sin. We don't overlook sin. We don't welcome sin. We recognize and acknowledge our sin and we're forgiven of our sin. And because we're forgiven of our sin, we can overcome our sin and we can live an overcoming life. So the remainder of our time, which is not long, I'd like to give you some life-giving prayers that you could maybe apply this week. And the first is this, ask God. And I've got them written down in your handout, but we can go through them real quickly. Ask God for his life to fill you. To fill you, to find you, to fix you, and to fill you. Ask God to do that. He loves finding us. He loves fixing us. And he loves filling us. And that's a good thing. Paul prayed, he says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray, God, fill me. Instead of fill me with my own thoughts, which your automatic response should, would, would normally be as you go through the days to fill yourself with your thoughts and your emotions. God, fill me with your thoughts and your emotions. Help me to see things the way you would see them. And tell me that that day doesn't go differently and better. Tell me that that doesn't result in a stronger heart to live life. 
Second way that we can pray life-giving prayer is ask God for people to receive knowledge that leads them to God's righteousness in Christ. Just pray for knowledge. How many of you would agree with me that God knows everything? <laughs> and how many would agree that you don't? So we can pray for God in His omniscience, all knowing that He would give us the knowledge that we need for that moment. In Romans chapter 10, Paul said that my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. So we can pray for knowledge to come to the people that we're praying for, that it would lead them to the righteousness of God that's found in Jesus Christ. And another way that we can pray life-giving prayers is to ask God for people to find God as their own, listen, their own perfect parent. God is Father. Now, I don't care how good your mom or dad was on this life of your earthly mom or dad. Some of us, you know, the spectrum is huge. Terrible, deadbeat, to excellent. But even if you look at it in comparison to the way God is our Father, here's the range. Here's bad parent, here's good parent, and here's God as your father. He's the best parent that anybody can have. And we all got some growing to do, right? So pray that God become your father. I know he already is. If you are following Christ, he's there. But pray that you can grow in your ability to see him as father. And then pray that for other people. Another way to pray for pray God uh, life-giving prayers is to ask God to prepare and promote people. And get this, even people you don't like. Now, I just want to throw down that challenge because a lot of you don't like somebody right now in your life. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but Jesus instructed us to pray for our enemies. And at, whether we like to admit it or not, there are times that some people, they can't even be friends, they seem to be our enemies at the time. Well, how do I pray for an enemy? How do I pray? Pray for their promotion. Pray that life goes better for them. Pray that God shows an abundant goodness to them. Well, I don't know if I can do that. I know you can't. But that's where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in, and He'll give you the words to pray. He'll help you pray those prayers. And there's a great thing that happens when, that, when you begin to do that, when you obey that precept from Jesus, that truth from, from Jesus. When you start to pray for that person, you start to care about that person. He works a This is an, another way that he enlarges our heart. He increases our capacity to love when we start praying for the people that we're hating. So well, I'm not hating. Well, yeah, yeah you are. <laughs> When you're banging heads and when you're... Tell me I'm not telling the truth, but that's hate. And God will help you pray for that person. And you begin to have a heart that's enlarged to, and your capacity to love that person grows. Doesn't mean that you need to roll over backwards and get stepped on. I'm not talking about that. But your heart of love, God kind of love, a different kind of love begins to work in your heart. It enlarges your heart. So ask God to prepare and promote people. Now the thing is, when God promotes people, even people that you don't care for, that you're in strife with, or that you're having difficulty with, when God promotes them, you know that God only promotes when they're ready. And that means, that implies that they did a work in their heart, right? Go over here. No, right? You start praying for somebody and God promotes them. That means that God did a work on them. So you're asking for God to move in their life. God bless them, promote them, strengthen them, encourage them, help them. And you start praying all of that and God begins to move and he lifts them up. Last 
way to pray a life, God. Not the only. These are not, this is just a few examples. But here's another one. We'll end with this one. Ask God, in order to pray a life-giving prayer, ask God for favor. Ask God for favor. I, I noticed this with Moses, that Moses asked God these words. And he says, if I have found favor, God, in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. How many of you would like to see God's favor on your life? Well, I got news for you. His favor's already on there. It's just a matter of waking up to it. But we can ask that. God, give me your favor with this person, with this situation. God, give me favor. And you can pray for other people. God, give them favor. God, give them favor. Max Lucado wrote these words in a gentle thunder. He said, I love the way he put this. He said, there are many reasons God saves you to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons... God saved you is because he's fond of you. He likes having you around. He thinks you are the best thing to come down the pipe in quite a while. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. <laughs> I love that. The man's got away with words. He says, he says if, if you had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he'll listen. He can live anywhere in the universe and he chose your heart. And I like how he ends this. He said, face it, friend. He's crazy about you. So let's start thanking the Lord right now for enjoying the favor that he's given us. And let's pray for God's favor to spread in our heart, enlarge it, and give other people favor too. Let's stand. Father, I wanna thank you for the favor that you've given each person here today. Lord, for those that are struggling with this concept that you're crazy about them. I pray that you would help them not to see themselves, but to see you. Not to be able to see the things that have weighed them down, but to be able to see the power of your spirit and your life inside their heart. And I ask that that would enlarge their heart right now. That where the dust is clinging, that they would be able to brush that off. Where sin has weighed them down, they would be able to come to you and know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us continually. And I pray, Father, for those who have not yet stepped into your kingdom. And I pray that you open their eyes to see you, Jesus, today. That they would know that today is their day. That this message, this simple message, that you're crazy about them, would blast away any other imperfection, that would blast away any other thought that would be contrary, that you really are in love with people. And God, out of our hearts, our hearts are enlarged now because of your word. Our hearts are empowered now to run again with new strength, and God, with that new heart that's enlarged, we just say thank you. We love you. You're amazing, Father. Beyond our dreams, amazing. And we honor you. Let your name be lifted in our lives this week, in all that we think, in all that we say, in all that we do. 
and all that we pray and help us, God, to pray life-giving prayers for ourselves and others this week that make a difference. Thank you for the path that you've made for us to travel, the light that you give to us on that path. Give us a heart of obedience that will follow that path and find the peace and the joy in following you in this wonderful journey that you've given us. There's nothing better, God. There's no one like you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a great, great day. God bless.